Welcome everyone to this month's Alcor webinar, UCF, how to identify the data you need to GDPR compliance. We are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. Alcor is a global cloud advisory and implementation services company serving Fortune 500, government agencies, and other leading organizations in multiple industry verticals across the Americas, Canada, and India. Alcor is a ServiceNow Gold Services and Service sale, Silver Sales Partner. We partner with leading technology companies, including FireEye, Microsoft, Dell, Incorda, MuleSoft, and Big Panda. We advise leading plat businesses on cloud platforms, architecture, enterprise service management, and integrating IT service delivery. We also provide business process consulting to capture, re-engineer, and improve processes that can easily be automated to deliver real value. The Alcor Consulting Team has excellence in business strategy, cloud technology, and organizational change management. Our ongoing webinar series is designed to inform, enlighten, and start discussions within your own organizations. If you require any additional information after listening to today's webinar, please reach out to us through our website, www.alcortech.com. Today's webinar is also on social media. You can follow, comment, and get regular updates for today's webinar with the hashtag Alcor Webinar. That's hashtag or number sign A-L-C-O-R-W-E-B-I-N-A-R. We have time reserved at the end of the webinar for Q&A, so please feel free to type any questions into the question section of the dashboard. Today's webinar topic is UCF, how to identify the data you need for GDPR compliance, presented by Karina Clever, Dorian Kojis, and Marcus Lamb. Karina is a client partner with Alcor Solutions and has an extensive background in operational risk, risk management, risk assessment and controls development, program management, process development, operational development, and maturing organizations both globally and locally. She has over 15 years of program and project management experience with enterprise-wide global regulated implementations and is a forward-thinking, creative, an innovative leader with extensive experience designing, building, and aligning IT solutions that integrate business and technology, while enabling business strategies and dramatically improving performance. Dorian Kojis is the co-founder of Unified Compliance and the primary architect of the Unified Compliance Framework and its SaaS portal, the UCF Common Controls Hub. Dorian serves as an advisor or working group member to the PCI Council, Financial Technology Forum, and other industry organizations. Previously, he was an adjunct professor of technology, lecturing and serving on the Board of Advisors for the University of Delaware. Dorian has written and spoken extensively on all areas of information technology and has won numerous writing and speaking awards. Marcus Lamb is a ServiceNow solution consultant based in Los Angeles. Marcus has been with ServiceNow for three and a half years and has seen the company grow from an ITSM solution to an enterprise platform. Along the way, Marcus has helped countless customers understand how ServiceNow can help their organization achieve goals across the enterprise. Whether that is by reducing risk or streamlining process, ServiceNow security and GRC help security teams do more with less. I will now turn the webinar over to our dream team of Karina, Dorian, and Marcus. Dorian, you're up. Woohoo! Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> All right, before we get going, we're going to ask a poll. And here are the questions Do you have a network diagram that shows your major systems? Now, this is going to become important as we go through. So I want you to take a minute to go through and think through that poll. I always like doing that when people take polls. It drives everybody nuts. Okay, we should be, we're going to give it about one more minute. The great thing about this webinar this morning is this isn't really 
a product webinar. This isn't one of those webinars where you sit through and you can, you know, suck down your cup of coffee and play with the dog and stare at your belly button. This is actually one of those webinars where you do need to pay attention because we're going to teach you something you can use. We're going to help you out with what you need to do for GDPR and how you can solve it, or at least some of the problems. So EU GDPR, EUJ, General Data Protection Reg, is the most important change, I think. I really do think in regulation in 20 years. Now, I can say that because I've been looking at these things for at least 15. The UCF is 15 years old this year. And we've examined over a thousand regulations. So the big question is really, do you have to deal with it? Well, unless you're a very small organization and don't process anybody's information from Europe at all, then you don't have to deal with it. Other than that, you do. Funny enough, even the UCF team, because we have people in the common control sub that are from the EU, we have to deal with GDPR. Why? Because we look at their information and we help them uh, make sure that they're, they're onboarding and that's actually a form of processing. So even we have to form follow GDPR. And, and this follows California regulation because, you know, when California 1386 came up, they were the first or place to say, we're going to protect California citizens no matter where your company is. Now, that was important because right after that, then you had Indiana, Illinois, you had then Massachusetts being the culmination of that. And now Europe is jumping on board. Well, there's a whole bunch of sites out there dedicated to GDPR. As a matter of fact, almost, almost 9 million of them now. The problem is, it's just most of it's crap, okay? Most of it is, I'm gonna sell you my answer because it fits the solution that I'm selling. Kind of like, you know, every, if, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. The authoritative word on GPR, GDPR, right there, GDPR. There's a secondary site, Arma International has done some really, really fine work on how to audit the records side of GDPR because it's a very records centric regulation. So those two sites right there are, are sites you need to go to. Well, some of GDPR is covered in, in everything. There are seven areas though that you probably haven't thought of because they're not covered in a bunch of the other regulations. You know, breach notifications, well covered by everybody. Consent, AICP rule, AICPA rules, you know, if you're, if you're doing a SOC 2 audit, well covered. Right to access be forgotten, well covered. Data portability, yeah, that's so yesterday. That stuff's been covered by everybody. GDPR really goes into the corporate binding rules, the records of processing activities, the data protection contract, and everything here on the right that you can read yourself that I'm not going to read for you because I hate people who read off the screen. So that's what's not covered. So let's go into that a bit. But before we do that, I want to I want to go over the what's not covered part with a shameless common controls hub plug. There is a way for you to go into the common controls hub and see what is covered and what is not. Now, what I've done up here on this screen is I brought up a lot of the the the, the standards and regs that that most of you are familiar with. In there, we've got Coburg. Uh, COBIT, when we've got NIST cybersecurity framework, we've got the two ISOs, we've got uh, NIST 853, we even have SOC 2's TSP 100 trust service principles. All in all, if you take a look at this list, you've got 1,156 controls that they cover, okay? That's a lot of controls. That's, boy, that's more controls than most people. Now, what I'm gonna do over here GDPR, and there's GDPR. I'm gonna select GDPR. And what it's doing in the background, little trolls are in there, little internet trolls are in there. It's now comparing what's in those first set of documents in A and what's in GDPR in B and saying, hey, look, there are still 48 controls that if you were following all that stuff, you weren't even looking at because they didn't cover it. Okay. By the way, I, I love this portion. At a normal rate of $60 an hour, 12 minutes per citations to read, tag and analyze all this stuff, you just saved yourself 273 hours or $16,356. And I'm really not kidding. To, to read 
those six documents on the left and compare GDPR on the right would have taken you a couple of hundred hours to do. You just did that in five seconds. And by the way, you can go to the commoncontrolshub.com for free and do that kind of comparison. This is not selling you anything. This is showing you that there are things you're not thinking of. And that's what we want to deal with today. We want to bring up to you and help you by pointing out that even in the Common Control Sub, if you were doing all those other things, here's a bunch of stuff in GDPR that you're not looking at. And the biggest one is the record of processing activities right here. It starts out pretty simple. Hey, you have to have this record of processing activities. And then you have to have 24 logging entries that no other authority document is covered yet. Let's say that again, 24 logging entries that no other authority of document is covered yet. Well, in this sense, disclosures, same thing with logging a data subject disclosures. Now it's that 36, some of those 36 actually overlap the other 24, all right? Data processing impact assessment. There are other avenues in here, 38 of these things that are not covered in any place else. Well, what does this really mean? Well, if you looked at section 30, and I'm just going to put this on the deck here, and you sort of drilled into those privacy controls and selected this one privacy control here, and then opened it up, all these controls underneath that in that list, those are those controls you need to know about. Okay. Now, somebody in my last webinar said, you know, you guys blow that out of proportion. The UCF team maps this stuff in, and you tell us to do stuff nobody else tells us to do. Well, uh, I have the answer for that now. This is what one of the forms looks like. All right. And all of those things in the previous slide where I showed you all those controls, this is all this. This is all Let's go to the previous one of those controls. All right. So, yeah, you do need to do this. Dorian isn't making this up. We, we don't put stuff in the common control sub just to stick it in there. It's stuff you got to do. So, you need to know how to complete such a form. You need to know these things right here. All right. Which department is doing the processing? Which system? You know, the category of the data subjects, all of this information. Which, by the way, is why I told you and asked that poll. Hey, do we have the answers for that poll, by the way? We do. Let me put them up. Oh, thank God. 67% of you have a network diagram showing your major systems. Yay. 20% of you. Uh, 20% of you are in trouble. 8% of you who don't know might be in trouble. The 4% of you, what's a network diagram? Really, seriously? Uh, okay, well, 60% at, at, <laughs> of you are doing good. So let's drop the poll. That's that's great. That's, that's more than most people. Let's drop the poll because what you need to do then with that data flow diagram then is two, three, four, and five. You need to build that data inventory. You need to identify those fields. You need to then ensure people, uh, and, and well, four and five, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with, I'm gonna let these guys deal with, but two and three are the things you need to deal with once you have that network diagram. Now that's nothing that the UCF can help you with. We can tell you what you need to know because that's what we do. We're a regulatory compliance framework. We, we take all these things together, we make them easy to read, we put them in a simple list and say, okay, Go, therefore, and do these good things, which is why we work with folks like Alcor, which is why we work with folks like ServiceNow, because the go and do good things is up to them to help you. And with that, I would like to pass this over to Karina, because she can tell you how to do what I just told you that you have to do. Thanks, Dorian. I always enjoy watching you. It's so powerful because we, uh, we're we're very grateful for folks like you who can help us be very successful uh, as we as we try to keep up with all these regulations. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining. 
Um, yeah, so we take the, uh, the UCF folks and then we take, uh, obviously, ServiceNow is on the call with us. So we're kind of right in the middle and we make all of this come alive. So I'll go ahead and start. You know, we're, we're a 10-year-old company now and uh, we're all over the U.S., clients all over the U.S., uh, offices all over the U.S. also. We're um, in the U.S., but we're also in other parts of the world and we hope to continue to branch out across the, the globe. We, we do system integrations for major cloud providers. You know, we, we have uh, core technology solutions that we work with, but then at the end of the day, the technology only does what humans tell it to do, right? So we really help companies gu and guide them into um, procedural alignment, organizational alignment, um, for just for we want all those optimal results. We are a... Uh, gold services partner, silver sales partner, uh, but but I kind of want to hop down and highlight the techno functional and technical consultants because you know you can have some folks that are really great SMEs on the technical side, but then they can't really extrapolate the, the business processes and they can't really uh, make the things on the screen come alive and be integrated with how that applies to you as a business. So we we really are proud to have a very strong team of people who can help all of these companies uh, that we've already implemented with and, and guide them along. Uh, we also get brought in sometimes to do training for ServiceNow and, and that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Pretty, you know, pretty, pretty useful information to have about us. Um, this slide is huge and really it's a testament of the types of different verticals we, we work with. So, you know, there may be a bunch of regulations overlaying all of these, right? I mean, retail's going to have PCI. If retail's publicly traded, it's going to have Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, we've got HIPAA in here. So uh, just a lot of regulations that touch all of these companies that we help them with. So uh, a lot of service offerings, obviously uh, do, uh, a hair and every every client is different. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I lead a practice for GRC and uh, I have a peer who leads a SecOps practice and all of these services really are they all roll under governance, risk, and compliance. So they all have governance and adherence to the policies that are in the company, and all companies want to understand their risk, and all companies want to make sure to be compliant with all the regulations that are out there and influencing them. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we collaboratively identify all those pieces that Dorian was talking about? How do we understand the process, the importance of the legal department? How do we translate all of that into our technology organizations? How do we start these conversations? Sometimes people find it hard to do. Um, I'm going to kind of give a high-level overview of the architecture of GRC and ServiceNow, and then Marcus is going to take it away and show us some real-life um, usage of GRC. So, we all know we want to identify our data, but we don't always know where to start. So we kind of start poking around and we hit IT. We're like, yo, those guys are really smart. They know exactly where to go. Um, and then when they don't have all the answers, we hit up the business line and say, hey, you, go, you guys use this data all the time. You know your own processes. Tell us, tell us what you, where the data is. Tell us what's going on. And they don't have all the answers either. And we then head over to legal and say, okay, what, what do you want us to do? What do you need for Article 30? What do you want us to track? And this sort of segregation, although a little comical with the characters, they're the best ones I could find, um, really is what we're seeing in a lot of companies. Uh, the, the ownership is either siloed in IT, it's siloed in the line of business, it's siloed in legal, and the real reality is it's a combination of all of those things. There has to be footwork that's performed across all the lines of business because every single one of them is really, really important to the overall picture. 
So we're going to start with the process. I'm going to use a little funnel here to kind of show how wide the top layer is. And this is like we're all dropping stuff into this funnel as we go along through this deck. So uh, process discussions are sometimes hard to have, uh, but you need ownership, right? You need to know who owns the data, who's your primary point of contact, and when is that stuff due? If you give someone three days to help you with some definitions, Keep it to three days because this law is in effect May 25 and we just don't have a lot of time. Start with a really wide, wide net. Understand at a high level where, how to categorize the processes that are being used and try to understand what's coming into that department you're talking to and what's going out of that department that you're talking to because they may be relying on some data from another department. So you want to keep everything in a central um, repository as much as possible. I, I am a huge fan of ServiceNow's knowledge base articles with a good kind of librarian structure that can be extremely powerful. But ask probing questions. As you go through and you interview these lines of businesses, and they're all different, and they all have different needs. The insurance companies, you know, HIPAA is a big deal. Um, whatever company you are, just make sure that you're understanding the purpose of why that data needs to travel through the processes that it does. Define that critical path. Right. Make sure that you know. Okay. Well, these nine things along this process. Uh, Four of them, I can't live without. I, I mean, it, it, it's a must-have, whereas the other stuff I, I, I can compensate and don't really have to see it. That's actually going to give you a really rough data categorization when you're done with that sort of a map. Don't forget vendors. Vendors are huge. Just because you have a vendor, it doesn't mean that your responsibility and liability for that data goes away. Please be really careful with that. So if there's a vendor involved in the overall process of handling this data for your business purposes, just identify the data, the, the vendors along the way. So now we have our business process and uh, we've thrown that into our funnel. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start narrowing, but before we get all the way down into IT, we're gonna talk about legal. Now legal is huge in this, uh, whole picture, right? So we've come in now as an input with our business processes. So what's critical here are the policies. Now, mind you, some of the policies could be owned by IT, and that's okay, but remember, legal owns GDPR. So there has to be a collaborative partnership that says, I'm IT, I have an InfoSec policy for my access controls. And legal has to say, oh, okay, well, check. This is a part of my Article 30 or w whatever other part of GDPR that they're looking to enforce. Um, you know, we have the importance of a classification policy. I, I can't underestimate that because your classification policy needs to give you your retention, destruction, your encryption guidelines at the very least. If I have a data set, how do I know how long I'm going to keep it? How do I know if I need to encrypt it? How do I know whether I have to go store it somewhere for, for how long? So retention, destruction, and encryption are really key pieces to GDPR that you have to know how to answer if the auditor comes walking in the door. And, and, and the only way you can justify that is say, here, dear auditor, here's my policy. Here's what I am operating under, right? So there's, there's of course, other legal pieces. There's your DPIA, uh, your establishing a lawful basis. So let's think back to the last slide. You've just gone through your business processes and you've said, for me to operate my business, I need to do the following things. These are really important. Another example of lawful basis, for instance, is Karina applies to your guys' company. Karina fails the criminal background check. Well, then two weeks later, Karina says, forget me. If there is a lawful basis in place for the HR department that says, 
we retain our failed background checks for seven years, then you don't have to actually go and fulfill that forget me request because it's a lawful, it's, it, you, it's a legitimate interest where you're choosing to retain that data. Maybe you can take Karina off of, you know, the food coupon and that's okay and that's marketing, but you have to make sure to define all of your business processes needs for why the data needs to be used. Uh, profiling is another example, setting up a marketing campaign. If you want to hit somebody in Kansas that drives a truck that's under 30 years old, all of those data pieces come together using algorithms so that you can create a marketing campaign to get somebody from one pickup truck model to the other by offering them a, a, a you know zero APR incentive to go move over into whoever's creating the campaign. So any of those parts of your business have to be identified. Uh, when you've gone through that back piece. Again, um, what you filed with the DPA, any data you transfer outside of EU, those have to be justified by corporate binding rules. Contact information you have to be able to provide. And of course, Doreen was talking to us about all of the logging and reporting that we have to be cognizant of. And so make sure that you're getting all of those requirements from legal. They're very, very important because they have to be uh, used in conjunction between your business processes, legal, and now, of course, we're going to step into IT. So now we have our business processes, our legal requirements, and now we have technology. Big space. Very, very important. <laughs> I mean, I've been in IT for 30 years now. Can't stress the, important of, of its, the importance of its significance. But again, Operating technology has to come from that governance perspective, right? So we have to say, you know, I know what my policies are. I know how my data is classified. I know what line of business uses it. I know how I'm protecting it, how it's being controlled and who has access to it. I know what goes somewhere else. And, and these are all flags that we have to have now in our technology based on what we got from the business lines based on what we got from our legal department, right? So most important thing obviously we're looking for is that personal data. Uh, we have 30 days to go ahead and um, bring, fulfill those requests with all those data points. And again, we have to figure out a way how to say, does my system have the capacity to do these five enactment functions, right? So can I delete my data or if I have a legitimate interest or lawful basis for keeping it, have I established a fork in the road for when a request comes in from somebody, I move over and say, you know, I'm not gonna delete you out of this piece right here because this is my tax record. I, I'm not gonna delete that. I'm not gonna delete payroll information. But over here, you want to get rid of the coupons. Okay, I'll delete you out of that. Um, you know, the rectification. Have I made a mechanism and an ability for that data subject to come in and say, you have some data about me, but it's wrong. And here's where it's wrong. Can you please change this? And people who have been hit by fraud know this so well. Right. So, and I have been in, in, in sometimes there's not an easy way to get to where you can make your request be heard. And so, of course, uh, you know, it does say that the ability to make these requests uh, to opt in, to opt out of all of these GDPR enactments must be easy. The word easy is used in the law. So you, you have to allow for a very a uh, smooth, quick way for people to say, here's my name, here's what I want from you, submit, right? Uh, portability, Dorian talked about. Access is an interesting one. Uh, you know, some people, some company systems may have the capacity to go ahead and allow data subjects to come in and um, access systems directly. It's, uh, it, this one's puzzling a few of us. 
uh, and, and so come see me if you have any questions on that. And of course, object. I object to how you're using my data, which is different from rectify. Um, and so knowing these and, and flagging the fact that systems have the capacity to fulfill these five requests is very, very important. So again, we're, we're establishing governance in our technology. We've got our business processes that came in, legal requirements came in. We, we have our governing direction, right? So now we're gonna go uh, take a look at our actual ecosystem in our technology space, and we're gonna start classifying it. So my favorite is the CMDB. My most favorite, anyone that knows ITIL knows why. Um, really the heart of the heart of the heart of everything. So um, classification of your ecosystem is really important. And I think you got to start with your nomenclature, right? Because I can call it a system. You can call it an application. The other guy can call it uh, whatever else, right? So making sure that your classifications are consistent consistent, they're very well published, and everyone knows the parameters. And don't use 74 of them, use four, because that way you can enable that consistent usage across your entire company. And now that you have your classifications in place, you can begin that flagging of, okay, well, this classification we're gonna use for if there's that critical GDPR-related data. And, you know, it doesn't always have to just be GDPR. You could be publicly traded. Maybe you have Sarbanes-Oxley. Maybe you take credit cards and you're at the right level. Maybe you're PCI. Maybe you process insurance claims and you're HIPAA. Maybe you're a bank and you have FFIEC, right? So whatever those governing policies are, you have to figure out a way how to say, here's my technology ecosystem, and here are the pieces of that ecosystem that have a governing policy on them. You also want to flag what is legitimately used, meaning don't touch the payroll system, but go ahead and hit up the marketing system. You want to flag which of those governing policies now are governing the, the systems that you're classifying now have documents that um, will kind of validate them or align them with that line of business, right? If you if you file the DPA somewhere in, in a European country, when did you file it? What was the number? And when did you file it? And who delivered it? Um, you you want to make sure to capture all of that kind of information. And so now that you have your classifications in place, obviously, you're, you're going to drill down to those attributes. Top of line, personal data, sensitive personal data, um, any profiling activities that that data is rolling into, and where is it? Do we ever send it overseas? And how is that data being protected, right? So, so now we have our classifications, our attributes that we've defined, uh, and now we're going to move into mapping everything. So there's there's going to be two mapping pieces, right? There's going to be your process mapping, and then there's going to be your data mapping. Um, really, really important to understand your process. If you get to this point, you may realize you didn't understand the lines of business as clearly as you thought you did in that first round a few slides back. Um, you're, you're now going to make sure that you know where the GDPR law comes into place, are there additional correlating processes? Um, what's out of my control? Again, this is where our vendors come in. Very, very important. You're not just throwing it over. You're, you're still accountable for that data. Uh, it's really important to know where that is. Uh, any influencers on the, pol on the processes that you're mapping out? Again, flag those policies that may be bending the way that the process is working along the way. And then when you have that process, now you're, you're going to be highlighting kind of the pieces of the data along the way in that path, right? You're going to say, well, we have 10 pieces of data over here for this process, but really four GDPR or seven are GDPR. Um, you, and you want to highlight the processes that are using all of those data pieces. Um, Again, protection is really, really important and identifying the data that's outside of your control. So when we're in the mapping spot, we've already as inputs have had our business processes, our legal requirements, the governance in our technology environment, the classifications, right? So now we know how to navigate IT a little bit better with those very clear 
classifications that are used that are not confusing. We've, we've now mapped our diagrams and our data flows. And finally, we're down to the very last field level, which is what Dorian was showing us. So this is huge. Uh, this is huge and this is what all of those prior steps have been uh, working towards. Uh, we, we know our systems or applications or whatever we choose to call them. We know the characteristics of, of whether or not it now contains personal data or, or other data that might be important to us, where it resides, physical or logical, third parties that are involved. Uh, we know what is the governance that actually uh, governs that field. Now, right, remember, we're at the field level. Um, and, and one of those fields could be our contact information for our DPO or our processor. We could know whether or not we've got the filings in place, all of those governing policies that we have internally, right? So it's important to make that differentiation between external and internal pro um, policies. Uh, how the data is handled and any of those processing parameters that are really required. So now, uh, at the end of this, I'm going to give you just a few conversation starters. Um, hey, Corinna? Yeah. Oh, yeah. never mind. Yep. A um, few conversation starters, um, just some ideas. You're going to get the slides. So um, just ask a lot of questions as you go do and, and, ex, and ex, all this exploratory work. And please remember, uh, it's sometimes it's okay to keep that personal data uh, and, and, and make sure that you have the legitimate interest for that. So um, I'm gonna go into ServiceNow GRC. We've got two more slides. Um, policy and compliance, there's three uh, applications within the ServiceNow GRC suite. Uh, policy and compliance is kind of your entry point. Uh, I'm gonna go through that in a minute. And this is where you define all of your influencers. Audit is really your way to define scope and timing. If an auditor comes in in February and says, I want to see everything for Q3, but only Sarbanes-Oxley stuff, uh, that's where you can actually define that parameter. And then risk, of course, uh, is checking on your adherence to the stuff that's inside your policy and compliance, in addition to, of course, uh, any inputs that you may get from someone like um, your vendor risk or your security incidents or um, any of those other types of tool items. So now real quick, uh, core components, you know, it starts with UCF, uh, kind of why they're on the phone, very, very critical. Uh, a lot of information that saves hours and hours and hours of mapping, because I used to be the person who used to do the hours and hours of mapping in the middle of the night with a highlighter and spreadsheets. So um, very, very thankful for their services. Uh, that, when all mapped out in UCF, gets put into the authority documents, uh, which also become citations inside uh, ServiceNow's GRC. This is your external influencers. Very important to remember this one. This is I'm PCI, I have to abide by PCI laws uh, or regulations or guidance. I have to abide by Sarbanes-Oxley and I also want to use NIST or I want to use ISO 27000. Those are all of those uh, external forces that help you figure out how to best run your business. That gets splashed into your policies. These are internal, right? So your internal policies don't have to verbatim be the same like those authority documents that they're conveniently mapped. However, maybe one company will say, I block all Facebook and the other part says, the other company says, well, Facebook is critical to our business development, so no way are we gonna block Facebook. So that's your internal policy to decide, and I can't stress the significance of that because a lot of people forget that that's a really key piece. So these live inside the policy and compliance application that we just looked at, and the, th the, the third uh, leg of the three-legged stool is your CMDB. So we talked about your uh, classification, we talked about your um, actual field mapping, and so they all live in the CMDB. So in order to execute on GRC in ServiceNow, you need your authority documents, your policies, and your profile types is really a grouping of your CIs. 
you know, some CIs may be applicable to Sarbanes Oxley and some may not. So this is very, very important to kind of um, highlight here. So once we have that, the three legs of our three-legged stool, of course, we want to make sure that we grade uh, all of our CIs. We want to see, are they high risk? Are they low risk? If they're, you know, some 12-year-old server under somebody's desk, might come up on a scan, but probably a low risk kind of item that we don't have to be super worried about. So once we have all of our grading in place, the uh, the policy and compliance uh, application, uh, now we start building our, within that application, we start now building attestations and controls for humans, or perhaps process owners, or uh, systemic indicators that go out into perhaps an existing application like change management or incident management or um, contract management or vendor risk, uh, right? So it, it kind of helps the whole tool work together with all of its data records. And really the results of both of these will give you a pass or a fail. The pass or a fail is gonna go ahead and update that overall risk posture for your company. And if there's a problem, it's gonna create an issue that's going to go back up to your profile owner, right? So the person that owns that technology piece of the environment is going to say, is going to be told, hey, you got something to fix because this indicator came back as a fail. So, so really the third uh, lane here is uh, audit and audit tracks audit engagements and that really makes it uh, very, very specific for my authority documents, Sarbanes-Oxley versus HIPAA, and my policies, I only want to test your InfoSec policy and not your change management policy against a certain type of profile, uh, right? So the, the audit application allows that um, customization uh, and, and scope definition, which also will give it pass and fail uh, criteria based on their requests, which will create issues if necessary. So uh, two quick other things here is uh, policy and compliance on, on your policy statements. Uh, there are knowledge-based articles that are generated based on the uh, policies that you choose to enforce internally into your company. And uh, also GRC workbenches is used for that risk framework. So uh, my final slide is how we can help you. Um, we are able to navigate all these regulations and, and, and frameworks, and we can definitely help you define those processes and the, the, the policies that are super important. Uh, we can help with all of this mapping that we just talked about, and of course, um, all of the technology that you might be using to make your life uh, a little easier on this. So uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Marcus. Thank you for your attention and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Marcus, you're up. Awesome, thanks Karina. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so that should be popping up now. And what we're gonna be walking through here is a little bit of some of the different elements that Karina mentioned. And we're not going to go into too much detail, but the idea here is that it'll give you um, some idea of how ServiceNow can help when it comes to showing and proving that you're meeting GDPR requirements. And so what you're seeing here is a quick little compliance dashboard that helps you understand how you're meeting overall compliance. And so you see a bunch of different authority documents here, right? We're not just tracking against GDPR. We can also track against things like ISO, SOX, et cetera. And that's where, for example, the UCS comes in, right? That common control hub that Dorian was talking about can be important to ServiceNow and help you to match up how your particular controls are going to help you to meet these requirements across um, these different regulations and these different frameworks that you need to adhere to. And so in our case, we're looking specifically at GDPR. So you can see down here that we have loaded that into here. And I can start to see how many different controls I might have active around GDPR and how many things I need to meet. And so we can go ahead and start to take a look at what those particular requirements might be. The idea here is that you can translate some of those specific requirements that the, um, that the EU lays out and start to define those within your organization around a particular policy um, that your organization may have implemented. And so, for example, if we drill into this, we can see all of those specific controls. We can see all of that information and those mappings being created right here. And so what we might want to do is actually take a look and investigate what specifically one of these particular regulations might be. Um, we could go ahead and take a look, for example, at establishing and maintaining a record of processing activities. 
And so this is the, the specific thing that Duran was talking about earlier around what are we actually trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish? And so we're going to go ahead and drill into this particular, what we call a policy statement. Really, this is the control that you're trying to meet. And so when you're going ahead and trying to meet GDPR requirements, the first thing, one of the things you may need to do is go ahead and start to define what particular policies you have in place that are going to help you to match this particular control. And so you're seeing here that this is a direct load from our unified compliance framework from the UCF. Um, we can go ahead and see those requirements being created. And this particular policy statement was also created by the UCF as a common control that can meet multiple regulations. And so when you see the citations tab at the bottom here, what this is actually doing is it's matching it up to multiple regulations. So right now, this particular one matches up to GDPR. But if, for example, this was also something covered by SOC, something covered by CCI, HIPAA, et cetera, you would be able to start to see some of those being matched up down here as well. And so this helps you to quickly map out and understand how you're meeting multiple regulations at once. The goal is to reduce that amount of work. If I meet this one control, I'm actually meeting a bunch of requirements across multiple different frameworks and authority documents. And so as we move forward here, the idea here is I can point this at a particular scope. And so in this case, we may be looking at particular departments or vendors. I could go ahead and modify this list to include things like GDPR applications, applications that contain EU-specific data. And this is going to create for me different controls. So in our case, maybe we're looking specifically at HR. We're looking at that onboarding process that Karina mentioned earlier. Or maybe how can we make sure that with our employees who are EU citizens, right, that we're meeting the regulations around processing their particular data um, and making sure that we provide, for example, data protection, impact assessments, et cetera, around that particular activity. And so let's go ahead and look at our HR department, for example, and the control that we may have assigned to them. And so as we draw into this control, the idea is that this may automatically get assigned to whoever you have designated as your um, data protection officer, as you start to build out that part of your organization, right? who is responsible for this regulation, we can assign this particular control to them. As we start to define what this control does, you can see some of the different categorizations, some of the ways that we can start to report off of this, and you can see along the top that we're creating a process for actually building out a control and meeting a control. And so the idea here is that when your auditors come, they'll be able to see this particular control, they'll be able to see the justification around how we proved out that this control is in place, and how we continue to prove that this control is going to meet the requirements that the EU has set forth. And so in this case, you can see an attestation here. Um, these are basically the assessments that you might be looking for. You can actually build out your DPIAA here. Um, so we could go ahead and edit this attestation, for example, to include specific statements to measure risk, to continue to ask specific questions to say our HR department around how they're going ahead and managing this particular control and the data of our EU employees. And so you can go ahead and add in different questions here. You can build this out to make sure that you're measuring the risk appropriately. And again, this is why you might assign this out to your uh, data protection officer or to somebody with that responsibility so that way they can fill this out um, and we can record those responses and store them for later. As you go ahead and do that, we can then start to associate into here specific things like risk. Um, so that way we can start to tie this back to the overall risk for our organization. And so this particular control here, right, the idea is that as we assign this out, we can start to manage the life cycle of this, we can measure it on a regular basis and ensure that we're still meeting those standards as we go forward. As we tie this to risk, right, this risk might be disclosure of business records, for example. And as you're going ahead and analyzing or evaluating this risk, we may have a series of scoring that might need to take place. And so you can actually send out another assessment to score your risk. Um, a lot of organizations do different risk scoring, so we have the ability to actually go ahead and calculate this based off of multiple different um, calculation methodologies. And so you could use qualitative or quantitative scoring to go ahead and quickly start to evaluate and show your, your risk for a particular um, area of the business. And so in this case, we're looking at the risk of accidental or, or intentional disclosure of business records. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so you can see here um, what we what may be happening when we do nothing versus when we do, um, when we implement everything that we want to. And so usually you're going to be somewhere in the middle here. So we can actually calculate a risk for you. Uh, Karina was mentioning that. And the idea here is that as you go ahead and calculate out this risk, it'll go ahead and help you do so based off of the controls 
and the indicators that have been evaluated. And so when we say that, what we mean is that these controls can actually be automatically or manually, obviously, evaluated. And based off whether or not they are compliant or not, that can actually change the scoring that you're seeing here. And so, for example, when we look at monitoring here, you can see that we're actually going to calculate the off indicator and control failure. As you might be wondering what's an indicator, right? We talked a little bit about controls, the idea behind a control, right? We assign it out to somebody and they can come in and attest to whether or not that control is in place. Um, what we can do with an indicator, though, is you can actually use these on both controls and risk. And what they can do is they can automatically pass or fail based off of data already within the system. And so one of the things around processing data records is, or for GDPR is that you have to notify um, your customers or your employees or whoever um, is in charge of that data, you have to let them know within 70 hours, 72 hours if there is a breach. And so this is a change from what we've been doing today. Right? Typically, it, you can get away with months, you can get away with um, it taking a while to go ahead and notify customers of a breach, for example. That's changing with GDPR, you do have to do so a lot quicker. And so what you can see here is we can actually go ahead and utilize, for example, supporting data from, say, ServiceNow Security Incident Response to check if it's made its SLA. Right? And this could quickly help you understand if we've had a breach, right? Did we actually solve it quickly enough? Did we notify people quickly enough? And so you can go ahead and see that. Um, you can build that process of notification directly into security incident, and we can pull back any results related to this particular um, mm. department or this particular business service or application mm. to help us understand, did we notify people within 72 hours of a breach occurring? And the idea here is that this can automatically pass or fail based off of data coming back. Um, if you think about ServiceNow, one of the things that Karina mentioned is that Alcor can help you build up the structure around how your organization looks from an application standpoint, from a networking standpoint, um, from tying that back to different business owners, et cetera. And the goal there is that as you put that data into ServiceNow, you can start to leverage that here. And so, for example, if you're missing um, specific statements for um, certain business processes, right? Let's say you list all of your business processes out and you're missing um, a data process owner for some of those different services. Right? You could you leverage this information here um, to pull back those particular services where the business process owner is either missing or maybe they went inactive, right? They moved to a different department, they uh, went ahead and moved to a different job. You'll be able to quickly prove that out and show where that's missing and then go ahead and update that data. And so the idea here is that as we move forward with risk, right, this can automatically change our risk score if this passes or fails. And if I go ahead and take a look at an overview dashboard, for example, we can start to evaluate our overall risk. Now, part of what ServiceNow does is we don't just evaluate internal risk, you can also do vendor risk. And so one of the things that Karina mentioned as well is making sure that you evaluate your vendors and ask them for how they're doing when it comes to risk. We do have a portal that allows them to go ahead and fill out risk assessments for you. And that can now include information around, say, EU protection of, of data related to e European Union citizens. And so we can go ahead and include that in here. And this overall risk dashboard can help you start to understand how that relates specifically to GDPR as well. And so from a very high level, that's some of what we can do. Um, I know we are running a little bit short on time, um, so I do want to... Um, turn it over for questions, but before I do that, one last thing we can do is we can also build out portals to do things like make sure that we can process requests around um, the data protection that we need to enable. And so if an EU citizen wants to request that their data be removed or their data be forgotten, for example, we can go ahead and create a process around that. You can see that um, that might be a link that somebody can click. Maybe you put that on your customer portal. We do have a customer service management application that can help you there. Or for your internal employees, it can also allow you to have a process for removing their data as well. And as you process that data within ServiceNow, again, we can pull that data in with the indicators to help show that you're either meeting the controls or you're mitigating the risk. And so that's the idea here is that we can tie all of that together. Um, there is an audit application as well where you can manage all this, but I think at this time it would be good to turn it over for questions. So are there any questions at this time as I go ahead and finish up here? Uh, that's fantastic, Marcus. Thank you. And thank you, Karina and, and Dorian. Uh, yeah, so in the interest of time, there are a few questions here. So um, let's just jump right into them. Uh, the first one was, um, Dorian, uh, during your presentation, um, did the last slide state it's about, um, and then it looks like pi question mark, not the same as personal data 
as defined by GDPR. So um, I didn't catch at what point uh, that question came in. So I'm not sure what slide the uh, uh, member was requ uh, requesting about. Oh, you, he was talking think? about personally. Yeah, the person was talking about personally identifiable information. Can you do me a favor and can you give me the the screen for a quick sec? Sure. So one of the things that you you've you, can everybody now see the compliance dictionary? Yes. Cool. One of the things that everybody's got to understand is what separates us from our cousins in in the United Kingdom is the English language. <clears throat> what separates all the regulatory people from everybody else is the English language. So what they'll do is they'll call personally identifiable information a lot of things. Well, we, we maintain a dictionary according to ISO standards, uh, ISO 704, 2009, uh, which we helped create, where we can have non-standard terms. We could have preferred terms. We, we know what the acronyms are. We know what the data definitions are. And we even know, if you can see down here, what all the relationships are. You can go to compliancedictionary.com absolutely free folks we maintain this dictionary so that when we're mapping the regulations to each other and to the common controls we feed all these terms and these definitions in to this dictionary and it talks to the natural language processors and ai engines and all that other stuff and we know that when someone says ah this is confidential personal information or this is personal data or this is personally identifiable information we know when it's the same thing and when it's not. So, so you know, leverage. And that's one of the things that Karina was talking about. When you're building your CMDB, uh, if you actually have a natural language processing engine enabled CMDB, you can call it different things and it will still come up and say, yeah, this is the same. If not, you really have to watch your language. And, and, and you can always turn to something like the compliance dictionary to, to find out when somebody's saying the same thing or when they're not. So there you go. There's there's the answer for that. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So um, I'll, we'll go to the rest of the questions. Just for anyone that's got to um, that has to leave uh, the webinar, uh, the recording of the webinar uh, will be on our website uh, www.alcortech.com. Uh, so if you do have to drop off, uh, you can listen to the rest of the webinar uh, on the recording. So uh, let's get back to the questions here. Uh, does data ownership accountability uh, sorry does data ownership slash accountability get transferred if used by different businesses I think I can grab that one um, the the best thing is to have one technical owner and one business owner because that one business owner can make some good decisions there may be different pieces of the process that you'll have different business owners for and a lot of times that's what we call departments or organizations so we know that data travels across all of the different lines of businesses and there needs to be a good enough representation for what that department uses that piece of data for because they can make the decision on whether or not it's critical for their operations right because i can have a bunch of noise in my environment and a lot of us do but when you sit people down and say, do you really, really, like really need this? A lot of people are like, well, say shrug and say, not as important as I thought it was. It was just there when I got there. And no, you, I, I don't want to be responsible for that. Take it away. So, so, so that's what I'm talking about with all of the questions that you have to really uh, talk to your lines of businesses about. Make sure that the ownership is very succinct. Okay, excellent. Um, what is the big difference between access and data portability with regards to what you have to deliver as an organization and in what way you have to present it? Dorian, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, I data think. access. Okay. The, uh, no, if you want to take it, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. All right. Well, data access is making something available usually through the web or, or, or you know, usually through the web these days. 
data portability means that you give them the information in a way that they can transfer into the applications that they use or other or, or other things. If you look at the PDF structures, if you look at some of the other structures, the XML structures, uh, you know, you have to make data portable so that people can bring it into other systems and, and see it in, in that way. How would you answer that, Corinna? Well, I would say, uh, yeah, so first it's system to system transfer. Second, it's a um, give me everything you know about me, maybe in an exportable format that I can go bring it to someone else. Um, the, the, the access piece from the GDPR perspective for the data subject is specifically for um, if a fast food chain gives me a portal to go into uh, and I can specify uh, my own preferences for the food that I buy from them. Uh, and they will give me a coupon every time I do that. Um, that may actually be extended into additional pieces of, so I mean, if, if you think about your insurance company, for instance, you access their system, right? You're accessing and setting your own preferences within their system. So that's the portability. Right, the yeah, it's, it's, it's about how to get the structured data out of one machine readable format and, into, and, and, and transfer it to any other uh, machine readable format without any hindrance from, from them. So yeah, how they give that to you and, and the portability of it is, you know, not just, hey, let me, let me scrape it off your website, but if you've got it in a structured data system, I want it so that I can send it anywhere I want as well. Think about sending your records from one doctor to another. Got it, okay. Uh, how are you planning on documenting processing activities or DPIAs within ServiceNow in regards to GDPR compliance? Uh, Don't so, know if that's a Karina or a Marcus. Yeah, I can definitely, um, or l l let me try to hit that one really quickly and then I, somebody can jump in. So, uh, so purposeful processing, purpose of processing is what you're going to get from your line of business engagement. And they just need to tell you why they need to have the data that they have. That is your processing. Your DPIA is actually a completely separate assessment that relies on this lawful basis and purpose of, of processing statements. So go ahead. So um, do you want someone else to answer or add to that answer? Do you want, do you want me to add to that, Karina? Yes, please. Okay, uh, could you repeat the question? Sorry, I missed it. Sure, no problem. Um, how are you planning on documenting processing activities or DPIAs within ServiceNow in regards to GDPR compliance? Yeah, so you could uh, you could create an assessment basically um, that matches what you would send out around a DPIA. Um, so as you're looking at you know establishing what that looks like within your organization, right? You could go ahead and create that assessment to go out from within ServiceNow and we will record that data for future use. So um, as you look forward and you say, maybe I need to utilize this for um, for a particular audit, we can go ahead and pull those results back and, and show those to the auditor. Right. Got it. Okay, uh, this looks like a good process to capture compliance information. Do you have a process, uh, do you have a process it consumer requests right to access or right to be forgotten. The concern is handling a large number of requests that could overwhelm the company. Set up your workflows. Yeah, I was just saying that's a that's an automated workflow. You know, we 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 have the same thing. You can you can come on in. So just case. Somebody comes on in and we have the, the common control sub and we email you and say, hey, did you do this? Did you do that? If they say, okay, I'm out. We actually have an automated process that can read the email and, and, and we just say, please reply and say and whatever it is that they have to say in the email. And then our system reads the email. It then goes on in, it deletes the records, it deletes what, what they need to delete and then sends them an email afterwards saying you have been deleted and we now know I get a report that says this this account has been deleted. 
So we, we have a documented process. Uh, you know, we've got one person running this and it's all automated. So set up a workflow and you can automate that easier than you think. Okay. All right. Got one here directed to Marcus. Uh, when you were looking at the policy statements, you were able to see the authority documents and citation description within the tab. I don't have those tabs available in my instance. Do you know the specific version we need for those additional columns? Yeah, good question. So I would say for that particular question, reach out to your um, to your sales rep. We can then take a look and make sure that you're on the correct version. Um, they did change GRC significantly, I believe, from um, I want to say it was H to I from Helsinki to Istanbul. Um, but yeah, we can definitely follow up with that one offline um, because I think that's more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, most instances that are on the newer version should see those particular tabs. So um, that's something where we would want to contact support potentially and make sure that we get you on the right version and it looks correct. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, all right. And then uh, one more question. What is the difference between mandated and implied controls? Oh, that's pretty easy. Mandated controls are the controls that they tell you that you have to do in your system. So if we look at the control list, and I'm gonna show you, all right, hopefully you can see the control list here. I'm gonna go through the control list, I'm gonna pop up something that's in A. See this bold one? That, one, that one's mandated and this one is implied. So if you go on down, you can't establish and maintain an audit program. Actually, that's a top level. Let me, let me go down to monitoring and measurement. There you go. Uh, all right, let's go down below these. I keep here we go. You can't conduct technical surveillance countermeasure surveys unless you have a technical surveillance countermeasure program, if, if that makes sense. So implied controls are those things that you have to do in order for the mandated control to make sense. So if somebody says you, you have to audit your logs, you know, that's, that's a mandated control. But the implied controls above that would be, first of all, you have to make sure you're synchronizing all the clocks and all the servers and you're collecting all the logs in one place. Because if you don't do that, you know, how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna interpret the logs for, for a suite of servers? So that's the difference between the two. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. We're about seven minutes over. Uh, thanks everyone for staying. Um, very informative. Uh, webinar today. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will be available on our website, www.alcortech.com, and through our social networking sites. Uh, thanks for your time and for joining, everyone. See you at the next webinar. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for for a webinar that actually meant something to to the folks watching. Everybody here really wants to help you with GDPR. If you noticed, this was about helping you with GDPR. Yeah, there are products involved, but this is going to help you get it done. And those are great webinars. So thank you, guys. Thanks, thank Dorian. You, Dorian. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, everybody else. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.